Good morning. I'm Jen Polly, Adult Ministry Director here at Bethany North, and I'm honored to bring God's Word to you here this morning. Our scripture comes from Matthew 5, 3. It says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And then Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let us pray. God, we pray this morning that you would open up our eyes and our ears to see and hear what you have to say to us this morning, Lord. Teach us about the nature of humility um, and what it means to be citizens in the kingdom of heaven. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So this is our last week in the Good Reign series where we're learning about the kingdom of God and what does it mean for Jesus to be our king. Um, And next week, we're going to start a series on the book of Joel. So the title for the sermon today is Humble Reign, as we'll learn about humility in the kingdom of God. With the election just over a week away, I'm sure many of you have either your ballot at home or you've already put it in the mail um, to exercise one of your rights as a citizen of the United States. In fact, citizenship in any nation or kingdom comes with a set of rights and responsibilities. Some of our rights include entitlement to protection of the United States Constitution, freedom to express oneself, freedom to worship, the right to work. Uh, right to run for elected office. And some of our responsibilities include obedience to federal, state, and local laws, participation in the military service if needed, paying taxes, respecting the right of others. However, the United States isn't the only government to which we're citizens of. We're first citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, it's even more critical that we exercise our rights and responsibilities in that kingdom, for it's the law to which we ultimately pledge our allegiance. In his research on kingdoms in the Old Testament, Scott McKnight, a biblical scholar, found that every kingdom has five elements, a king, a rule, a will, a people, and a land. So in the Old Testament, Um, God exercised his kingship um, as he revealed himself as Yahweh. And he exercised his kingship through the Davidic line. He ruled by rescuing his people and governing over them as Lord. The people was the nation of Israel. The will or law was the Torah given through Moses. And the land was Israel. Therefore, when Jesus came in to usher in the kingdom of heaven, it would have been crucial for the Israelites to understand these basic elements in his new kingdom. How would he rule over them? Who were the people of the kingdom? What would be the land of that kingdom? As citizens of this kingdom, we come to the text with the same questions. One of the main ones being, how are we to live in the kingdom of God? Instead of the law being founded on the Torah given to Moses, Jesus set up a new kingdom ethic in the Sermon on the Mount. The foundation of this ethic is found in the first beatitude. Here, Jesus teaches that in the new kingdom community, it is the humble who reign and receive blessing. So we'll explore the first beatitude to discover the type of person who receives blessing, when they will receive it, and how that blessing transforms the kingdom community. So first, let's take a look at the type of person who receives blessing. So in our American society today, what type of person would you consider to be blessed? The hard worker, the wealthy, the money saver, the educated, maybe the beautiful and fit? Jesus doesn't use any of these examples. Instead, he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. But what does that mean? So first, with this word blessed, 
of the word is makarias in Greek, which has been translated as happy or blessed, but there's a lot more here to that word that isn't expressed. One commentator noted it would be better translated as God blesses, or that these are the type of people who have God's favor. And then on the other side, this is the only time in the New Testament that the phrase poor in spirit is used. In fact, it's the first time it's ever been used in any kind of literature. So it would have been a novel phrase to the Israelites. The prevailing interpretation has been the humble, but that doesn't fully encapsulate the meaning. The word poor or tokas in Greek suggests absolute and abject poverty. It's the person who unabashedly begs for food because he has no other way to receive it. It's the kind of poverty that when we see it on the street, we look the other way because it makes us uncomfortable. Therefore, the spiritually poor are those who are in desperate need of God's grace, as opposed to those who strive for righteousness by merit. It's a humble dependence on God, regardless of what anyone may think of him. There are many individuals in the Gospels who demonstrate this type of poverty of spirit. There's Bartimaeus, a blind man, who, as he hears that Jesus is walking by, he shouts out above the crowds, Jesus, son of God, have mercy on me. It's the sinful woman who comes to a Pharisee's house, regardless of her reputation, and washes his feet with ointment and with her tears. Can you identify with this type of humility? Or have you been proving yourself or seeking God's favor in other ways? maybe by checking the right boxes of religious behavior, by having a daily quiet time or attending church service or watching it on the stream, feeding the homeless, or is it in financial security through your 401k or investments or your job, or maybe politics through a political cause or candidate? God blesses the humble meaning that the blessings of the kingdom of heaven start when we are willing to let go of our security, let go of righteousness by merit, let go of being right, and beg for God's grace and full repentance. Now that we know the type of person who receives God's blessing, let's look at when that blessing occurs. So in the United States, uh, the rights and responsibilities given to citizens are only a present reality, meaning that they only pertain to the citizen in their lifetime and also only so long as the United States remains a democratic government. When we look back on history, there's no human government that has had an eternal reality, not Israel or Greece or Egypt or Babylon or Persia. None of them have lasted until today. The United States isn't eternal either. When we look at the Sermon on the Mount, we get a different picture of the kingdom of heaven. This beatitude says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Then Jesus continues to say, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And he goes on and on with these beatitudes to talk about a present and a future reality. Our second point is that God's blessings are for the present and the future. But what does Jesus mean by this? The kingdom of God is different from any human government or kingdom because it both has come and is coming. The people of God live between the ages, feeling the tension of this reality, of Jesus, the tension of Jesus' first coming, the already, but also the not yet, of his final return and judgment. So how will this play out? So let's go back to Scott McKnight's analysis, looking at the kingdom of God. We know that he revealed himself as king through the person of Jesus, 
He still rules by governing and rescuing his people. The people, instead of being Israelites, is now the church. His will or his law, instead of being the Torah, is now the Sermon on the Mount. But then with the land, while the land of the Old Testament was Israel, it's now presently the earth. And then in the future will be the new heavens and the new earth. For example, if we look at the, a couple of verses down, at five verse, five, uh, chapter five, verse five, he says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. This is spelled out in Revelation when John speaks of the end of times. He says in Revelation 20, verses four through six, that when Christ returns for his thousand year reign on earth, those who had been killed for not worshiping the beast will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. Then he speaks of the reign of followers of Christ for all eternity in Revelation 22, verses four through five. They, referring to his servants, will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads and night will be no more. They will need no light of lamp or sun for the Lord God will be their light and they will reign forever and ever. While being a right or being while well, a right of a U.S. citizen is to run for elected office, a right of a citizen of heaven is to rule over the new heavens and the new earth. This is a message of hope. Jesus was speaking to a nation that was utterly powerless under their oppressor, oppressors, the Romans. But he promised that they would one day have power again as they would inherit the earth and get to reign in the kingdom of God. The same message is for us today. Our hope does not come from a particular result in the election, whether it be from a winning candidate or policy. Our hope comes in the future fulfillment of the kingdom of God when we get to reign with Christ. What can we let go of because of that reality? Lastly, let's take a look at how that blessing transforms the kingdom community. Notice Jesus' use of the third person plural in the Beatitudes here. He doesn't say blessed is the poor in spirit for his is the kingdom of heaven. But he says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This, this blessing is not for the individual but for the collective. It follows for all nine of the Beatitudes. In our individualistic culture, this can be hard to wrap our minds around as we tend to think of our spirituality as something that's just between me and Jesus. But when we demonstrate humility before God, it affects all of our relationships. Recently in our house church, the oldest man had confessed his sins to the group and repented. And later I reached out to him and I said, thank you for your humility and your, uh, your transparency. Because when you as the eldest male in the group confess your sins, it gives permission for everyone else to do the same. And he responded by saying, I do it because it's modeled to me from the pulpit. This is the nature of humility. It begets more humility. I know for me, it's not when my husband points out my sins that I'm quickly humbled. In fact, my reaction is usually the opposite, I become more defensive. Uh, but when he comes in full humility and confesses his sins and repents, it paves the way for me to do the same. Many of you may be thinking, well, my spouse doesn't do that, or my coworker needs to be the first one to take the step. But we don't have to wait for someone else to take the first step because Christ already did it for us. If we go back to our scripture in Philippians 2 verses 5 through 8, he says, Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself to the point of death. He bids us to come and do the same. 
In Matthew 16, 24, he says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We can be humble to the point of death because of Christ's example. Then our humility begets humility around us and transforms our community. Our third point is that humility transforms the kingdom community. How could your humility make waves of change with your roommates, with your spouse, with your coworkers, your political opponents? Lastly, we know that humility is the way to blessing, but where do we start? When John the Baptist preached about the coming of the kingdom of God, his proclamation wasn't, the kingdom of God is at hand, get your act together. Or the kingdom of God is at hand, let's overthrow the Romans. Or the kingdom of God is at hand, get your investments in line. No, it was the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. The kingdom of God is for those who humbly repent at the feet of Jesus. The good news is that the law of our great king isn't a set of rules of do's or don'ts that we have to modify our behavior around. Rather, we're given a set of promises for the character traits that have God's approval. We're promised that God blesses the humble, God's blessings are for the present and the future, and humility transforms the kingdom community. There's a sign at a local church uh, that says, when you pray, get on your feet. It's a call to social justice. And while they're absolutely right that we need to have our prayers backed by action, there's a step that has to precede that. This first beatitude would rather say, when you pray, get on your knees. The gospels are full of such people who not only got on their knees at the feet of Jesus, but who did so no matter what anyone thought of them. When we go back to Bartimaeus, because of his boldness and audacity, people told him to be quiet. But Jesus called him toward him and healed him. With a sinful woman at the Pharisee's house, the Pharisees scoffed at her and said, do you know what kind of woman this is? But Jesus blessed her and looked at her with compassion, and he forgave her. Some of you might be thinking that, you know, pastors have this all together. Um, they're, as professional Christians, that they're pretty good at knowing how to act before God and um, just have their spirituality right. But I can tell you that that idea is wrong. In fact, this last week, I've had this feeling of just kind of a dull time in my time with the Lord. And that's pretty freaky when getting ready to preach God's word to his people. And this morning, as I was getting ready to speak before you, I fell to my knees before God and said, God, I can't do this without you. In fact, I won't. Unless I know that you are with me, Pastor Raul's going to have to get up here and come up with something else to say. And I stayed there until I was assured of God's presence with me, that the Holy Spirit was upon me. And as I got ready afterwards, I looked in the mirror and I laughed because I had an imprint of the floor on my forehead. And I, it was funny because I was thinking, well, I guess if the mark of the Holy Spirit is the mark of the floor at Jesus' feet, then I guess that's one I can wear with honor. Right now, in your own home, before your roommates, your family, will you humbly come before the Lord? Will you come to the foot of the, of the cross and receive his blessing for you and for your community? The worship team is going to close with a song inviting each of us to the altar. And while we may not have an altar in our own homes, we can still come to the feet of Jesus. Will you come to him desperate for his grace, no matter what anyone else in your home may think of you? For it's in doing so that we allow, allow the power of the cross to transform us and everyone around us. 
Let us pray. God, we thank you that when we come to you, you require nothing of us. And yet you ask for us simply to bring all of ourselves before you in humility. God, I pray that each person would feel led to do that now. That you would humble our hearts and transform us and our communities so that we would be more like you. It's in your name we pray.